This is uh, July the 15th, and we are in the, the state of Kentucky today. Uh, not too off far from Boonesboro, and a lot of events that happened there. And this is a piece of land that belongs to one of my sons and his wife who own this property. And they hope to build a house here one day and live happily ever after. And we wish them all uh, to be so. But it's a beautiful piece of ground up here, very beautiful. And Kentucky is a beautiful state and a lot of good things up here in Kentucky. So we're glad that you would join with us today. And we're right beside an apple tree he's planted already. And uh, so he hopes to have some apples here one day and to make, uh, make a, 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 some apple pies with some of that. It'd be a good thing, I believe, wouldn't you? Well, I wanna, I wanna pick up where I left off the last lesson out of the book of Galatians. We're studying the book of Galatians today. And we started uh, chapter one the other week. And we've about gone through chapter one. I think we'll pick up in chapter two. Paul in chapters one and two gives a recital of his uh, early days in the ministry and his years before he became a Christian and then uh, the first few years after that that he became a Christian. And as he began to write this, he was recounting his history and some of the events that had happened in his life and early history, which vindicates his apostleship. He goes on to make to tell us uh, how that uh, he was an apostle called of God, not of men. How he had not actually met men nor the other apostles until after his conversion. We learned that from chapters one. As we get into chapter two, then he begins to recount more of his history uh, uh, prior to the writing of the book of Galatians. Verse one, then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. Of course, this is one of his missionary trips and he went back to Jerusalem. And when he went, he said, I went up by revelation. In other words, he said, God has guided me there. God gave me the light and the understanding to go up. He said, and I communicated with them. Uh, he said, I communicated with them uh, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. He said, I wanted to share this with them, the gospel that I preach unto you Gentiles. And he was doing that very thing. And he says, but privately to them which are of, the, which are of reputation, uh, lest any means I should run or had run in vain. He said, I wasn't just giving this out to anybody. He said, I was giving this out to men of reputation, uh, men who knew the gospel and knew what it was. And so Paul said, I didn't give it out just to anybody, lest I just wasted my time in vain. And by that, he means that these deniers of the gospel and these Judaizers, which were not in agreement with the gospel and who taught another so-called gospel, which he's already said was not a gospel, uh, that's who he's talking about here, that, he's, that he did not uh, give that gospel to those people. Uh, but he wanted to confer first with these at Jerusalem who were of reputation. And then he says, uh, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And of course, the manner of circumcision was coming up very early in these early days of the church. Uh, very little of it comes up in our day because circumcision is, uh, is practiced. But as far as being a part of our salvation, we know and understand very clearly that uh, that circumcision is not a part of our salvation, uh, nor is it ever meant to be. It's an Old Testament ritual, and due to health reasons and good health uh, uh, items, we practice that as, as Gentiles, circumcised Gentiles. But it's not part of our salvation. But in these earlier days, there were these who were requiring that the, uh, that the uh, Gentiles should be circumcised too as part of their salvation. Now, Paul knew this was error, and uh, as he goes on to describe what era that it actually was. He says, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. He says they understood, uh, the ones of reputation in the early church, that uh, circumcision was not part of salvation. And he says they didn't, uh, didn't ask Titus to be circumcised. He says Titus was not a Jew, but Titus was a Greek. Verse 4, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in. Well, now he begins to mention this doctrine that was brought into the church of Galatia, and he calls them very clearly what they were, false brethren, false brethren. Unawares, they snuck in is what they did, unawares. Uh, they brought it in. He said they came in privately, 
to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us un unto bondage. He said that is the purpose. Uh, as we know, the law brings you under bondage. It does not bring you to freedom. Christ Jesus and faith in Him brings you into freedom. Freedom from the law, freedom from the penalty of the law, freedom, freedom from the works of the law. And make no mistake, Paul was exactly right about this. As Paul said before, he didn't uh, disannul the law. He didn't try to destroy the law. Uh, he says actually he upholds the law. And we, and we, we can have that viewpoint of the law. We realized that it was good. Uh, there was nothing bad about the law, but the law brought condemnation. The law did not bring unto us eternal life. And uh, Paul goes on to say very clearly in his epistles how that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. That's why we don't practice trying to keep the law. Now, if you think you're saved by trying to keep the law, uh, you need to read, read right along with me in your Bible, and you'll find out very clearly that we're saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ, that and that alone. But these men who came into the church at Galatia, they snuck in there. Uh, they wanted uh, to bring these people again unto bondage. Christ had set them free. Paul knew that he'd been set free by the grace of God. And he wanted the people in the church of Galatia to know and understand that as well. But somehow or the other, these false brethren had snuck in there uh, and had uh, started spreading their false doctrine. Verse, let's read on another verse or two right here. Verse 5. To whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. He said, we listened to them uh, for just a few minutes. Uh, not an hour, not for an hour, but we did listen to them. Uh, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. We wanted to know what they were saying. And that the truth of the gospel would make sure that it was given to you clearly. And uh, so that there'd be no doubt about the matter. And who was telling the truth and who was not telling the truth. He said, we listened to them, but not long. Verse 6, he describes what he heard when he listened to them. But of these who seemed to be somewhat... Well, they had a following in the church of Galatia. There were those that listened to them and took after what they had to say, as false as their doctrine was. Now, in parentheses, in verse 6, he says, Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. He said, For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Paul said, These guys put on a good show, is what he's saying. He said, They looked good. They talked good. Uh, they had fire speeches, no doubt. They were smooth in their words. Uh, they were crafty in their speech. Uh, they were quite the ones, you know. I mean, they could sell, they could just sell a bill of goods as false as it was. That's what they had done. They came into the church of Galatia privately, unawares, and then they began to spread their doctrine of circumcision added to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we'll see later. But Paul says these, they seem to be somewhat in conference. In other words, they put on a good talk. I mean, they really looked good at the microphone. Uh, they were, uh, they, I mean, they were probably some handsome guys and probably had great oratorial ability. They could really speak. They uh, could uh, explain their point as if though it were a matter of fact. And I tell you what, we live in a day when we're just surrounded by people who seem to have that ability. They get before the news camera and they could sell you a big lie. Uh, and make you think, surely it's so, just the way they present it. Well, these people in Galatia, uh, they must have been uh, some uh, 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 pre-runners of these guys we have in our day. Paul said, they added nothing to me. When Paul listened to them, he says, they had nothing to tell me. Nothing. And that's the way it is. If you run across somebody who is uh, spreading a false gospel, uh, they've got nothing to add into you. You'll recognize it the minute that you hear it if you know Jesus Christ and the truth of salvation. I was uh, caught by an advertisement the other day. Some religious group had on uh, uh, the YouTube channel, and I looked at that for a minute. It wasn't long. I said, wait a minute. These guys here are running astray. They started off uh, looking pretty good and talking nice, but now look what they have said and what they've added to. And I recognized right off, this is false doctrine these guys are dishing out, and they're... Uh, they're hinging on a work salvation, which means they must as well be denying the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, I guarantee you, every false cult, you just look at it, they'll deny the deity of Jesus Christ, and they'll show you a works plan for your salvation. Every single one of them, uh, they'll do that. They will not tell you the deity of Jesus Christ to be so, and they'll also hand you a rule book of do's and don'ts for you to follow. They'll tell you, you do this, and you brandish your money. 
and they all will be glad to take your money. You can count on that. They will uh, very happily take your checks and your donations. Uh, they want that. They, they really want that. And they'll tell you, you give to our group, and you'll for sure have yourself a place in heaven. Uh, they teach stuff like that. I know I'm, I'm really cutting through some of the slack for them and telling you the basics of it and the way I'm putting it. But you study it out. You'll find that's exactly it. But let's look on in verse 8 here. Uh, verse, uh, verse 7, actually. But counterwise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Well, Peter, he had used the keys on the day of Pentecost and is credited with being an apostle to the circumcision. As we know from Paul's history already, that he had been carrying the gospel of the, uh, to the uncircumcised. He said, that gospel is committed to me, and the other gospel is committed unto Peter. Uh, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Now notice what he's saying here about Peter and Paul. Don't get the idea that Peter preached another gospel than what Paul did. No, they did not. Peter preached salvation without works by faith in Jesus Christ, just exactly as Paul preached it. Paul went, goes into much greater detail in his epistles, uh, explaining uh, many different angles of it or many different views of it but he, he's definitely they preach the same thing salvation by grace uh, peter wrote of grace as much as any apostle did uh, you read the word grace in his epistles uh it's there uh, it, from beginning to end and peter as well <clears throat> uh, spends several of his verses uh identifying false preachers and false brethren and so uh, <clears throat> and paul did in places as well so you see, actually, that Peter and Paul <clears throat> knew the same God. As, Peter, as Paul says in verse 8, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Notice he's saying we're both serving the same God, we're both preaching the same gospel, and we're both uh, going to get people saved. Verse number 9, <clears throat> excuse me, And when James... Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars in the church of Jerusalem, perceived the, the grace that was given to me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go into the heathen, and they into the circumcision. So the early church fathers, <clears throat> when Peter came <clears throat> and rehearsed what he preached unto them, and told them these of reputation, uh, they gave to them their blessings. They gave to them the right hand of fellowship and blessed them in their work, that they should go on and continue in the work that they were doing among the heathen and that they would continue their work among the circumcision, uh, thus referring to the children of Israel. And so uh, you see there was no, uh, Paul was not a renegade. He was not a hostile type apostle. Uh, he was out way away from Jerusalem preaching. Uh, to the heathen but yet they preached the same gospel they believed the same thing about jesus christ his death his burial his resurrection and his finished work for our you and our salvation upon the cross that he bore our sins on they preached the same thing like i said paul goes into great minute detail describing the doctrine of justification by faith and the doctrine of grace. Uh, Peter goes quite in the detail of it too, but Paul goes a little deeper. And then if you look in verse number 10, only they would. Here was the only thing that, the, uh, that uh, James, Cephas, and John asked that they would do. Verse 10, only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. And you know from uh, Romans, as we closed out in Romans the other week, uh, that Paul was wanting to make that trip to Romans to bring the gift of charity from the uh, uh, onward uh, to the people at Jerusalem. So Paul says, yes, I am very, very forward uh, to uh, remember the poor that's in Jerusalem. And uh, John and Cephas and James they said, Paul, if you'll do this, we're just all together for you. We're in agreement to what you're doing and what you believe. And Paul says, well, sure, I am glad to help the poor at Jerusalem. And he did that. It, it's borne out in the other epistles and letters that he actually did have a part in uh, telling other churches about the need of the people uh, in Jerusalem. 
you see what had happened in Jerusalem was there was great persecution against the Christians in Jerusalem during the early church period. Great persecution. They had been driven from their homes. The Jews had run them out, run them as far as they could. And there was a lot of suffering. They wouldn't trade with them. All kinds of things had happened to the saints in Jerusalem. And then uh, verse number 11. We'll look at one. Uh, we're, we're just about out of time here, I guess. So I guess I have to close out with verse number 10 today and uh, bid you God speak. But you know, I've covered a lot of ground here, and I've covered a lot of basics in this, uh, in this session. And it may be that there's some of you, you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and you've never asked Him to come into your heart and to save you from the eternal uh, fire of hell. And if you've never done so, why not make today the day that you would do so? Whether you live in Kentucky, South Carolina, Tennessee, or North Carolina, you know, you could go to hell from either place. But wouldn't it be good to go to heaven from whatever state you may be in. May God help you to do so.